Hello everyone. I am sorry that I'm not here today, but today we are going to start our unit on ecology. Ecology is the study of living things and how they interact with both each other and their environment. And today we're going to start off with some C notes on energy flow and relationships in ecosystems. So you should have your C notes out. Anything in blue, I expect you to write down. So let's begin. The first thing you need to know is that our worlds can be broken up into different groupings. And so the smallest one that we're going to start with is the organism. And then we're going to expand to the population, expand even more to communities, even more to ecosystems, biomes, and then lastly, the biosphere. So to begin, the first one is an organism. And as you know, that's just one individual. So one human being. Uh, it could be one cat, one dog, one bison, one bacterium, one dragonfly, one bunny. Just one individual is an organism. And then I just want to remind you that a species is a group of organisms that can breed to have offspring that are fertile. So basically their babies can have babies. So remember, ligers are not a species, not mules, but you know, cats are a species, humans are a species lizards, etc. So that brings us to our next grouping of populations. A population is all organisms of the same species in an area. So the same type of animal or same type of organism all in the same area. That would be like all the Lacalina students make up our school's population. All of the people in Santa Barbara are an example of the popu a population here, or bison in grassland, or lions in a savanna. So all the same type of animal or organism, all the same species in one area. So then the next grouping is community. So at the community level, that is all the populations in an area. So that would be not just the human population, but the population of cats and dogs and ants, all in Santa Barbara. Another way to put this is all biotic factors in an area, and we'll define what that means some more a little later, but biotic means, well, you know, bio means living, so all living factors in an area. Anything that's living is part of our community. Um, you could also look at a meadow community, and that would be the hawks and the snakes and the mice and the grass. So after community, the next level is ecosystem. And an ecosystem is biotic and abiotic factors in an area. So if bio means life, we have living and, and then abiotic, any word, well, many words, with the letter A in front, A means not, Bio means living, so abiotic means non-living. So we have living and non-living factors in an area. And that just means all the organisms that interact with each other and their environment is part of an ecosystem. So in my picture, I have an ocean community. So there's sharks, there's fish, there's shrimp, there's plankton, and it's not just them, it includes the temperature of the water, the amount of sunlight they get, the salinity, how much salt is in it, how much um, the pH of it is. So an ecosystem is both the living and non-living parts. The next one is a biome. And I've heard some of you use this word before, but for those of you who don't know, a biome is a group of ecosystems with the same climate. And climate is just long-term weather. So it's weather over the whole, like generally over the years in that area. So a group of ecosystems with the same climate. Um, Santa Barbara has a Mediterranean climate. Um, we, there's also deserts, rainforests, grasslands, and throughout the whole world there's many different biomes, but in this picture you can see even just within North America there's many different kinds. So biome is ecosystems with the same climate, same type of weather for long periods of time. And then the last grouping or 
um, level of organization is the biosphere. And that is all the ecosystems on Earth. So pretty much everything on Earth, the living and non-living parts, is the biosphere. All ecosystems on Earth. So as a review, we have an organism, then expanding more. Population would be many of the same organism. So let's say one human being, a population would be many human beings in Santa Barbara. A community is all the living factors in an area that would be the humans, the dogs, the cats, the ants, the plants, all in Santa Barbara. Our ecosystem is the living and non-living factors, so biotic and abiotic factors. That's part of our Santa Barbara area for us. Biome is a group of ecosystems with the same climate, so desert or rainforest. And then biosphere is all the ecosystems on Earth. And here is a picture taking you through with little fish. So you can see just an individual fish, then its population of the same fish together, community with now it has some crabs and grass, etc. So the next thing we're going to define is the words we've been talking about already. So abiotic factors are non-living, remember A is not, bio is living, so non-living physical and chemical parts of an environment. So the environment has two different parts, abiotic and biotic. The non-living parts as you can see in this picture, are like the sunlight, the soil type, the amount of water, temperature. And then the other side of it is the biotic parts of an ecosystem, and that's the living organisms, the living components. So that would be plants, animals, bacteria, fungi. So we have both aspects now. And here is a more extensive list of abiotic factors. Temperature, pollution, climate, remember long-term weather, precipitation is amount of rain, so all those non-living parts of an environment. And then the living parts, the biotic factors, include plants and animals, decomposers, which we can all kind of clump into prey, predators, parasites, etc. And then the next thing is we have two main ways or types of energy use. There are producers and consumers, and I know you've heard of these words before, but producers make their own food, and they're known as autotrophs. Auto is self, troph is food or eating, so they, have, they get their food themselves. They can just, for example, plants can be out in the sunlight. They don't need to eat anything else to get their energy. They can get it from the sun. So they make their own food. They're producers. And then the other side of it is consumers. So consumers get their energy from consuming other organisms. And they're known as heterotrophs. Hetero being different. They get their food from different sources, not just from on their own. So an example of a consumer is us. We obviously can't just stand out in the sun and feel full. Um, there are many different types of consumers. So we have herbivores, carnivores, omnivores, detritivores, and decomposers. And we've heard about a few of these, so I'm just going to briefly go through them with you. So herbivores only eat plants. Carnivores only eat animals. You might have said meat. Omnivores. Omni means all. So omnivores eat both plants and animals. Then detritivores and decomposers are actually pretty similar, but they're slightly different. So I'll show you those definitions. Detritivores feed on dead plants and animals, whereas decomposers break down organic material. So you remember how we learned about the fungi and how they have to put enzyme on their, the dead organism. It breaks it down and then it absorbs the nutrients. That's what decomposers do, whereas detritivores actually eat and feed on the dead animals and plants. So then you 
should talk to your elbow partner and write a list in your C notes of two different consumers for each of the categories. So two carnivores, two herbivores, two omnivores, two detritivores, and two decomposers. And you may need to pause the video to allow time for this. So the next thing we're going to talk about are feeding relationships and that basically is who's eating who. So we show feeding relationships with arrows and you've probably heard of them as food chains and food webs. So energy flows in one direction in an ecosystem. And really what that just means is that energy flows from what is being eaten to what is doing the eating. So energy goes from the prey into the predator. So we show energy flowing into the predator with an arrow. So arrows point in the direction that the energy flows. You can also think of it as the arrow means is consumed by. So food chains and food webs really should start with the sun because that is where we, most things get their energy. But looking at the producer in this picture, we have grass. And then we have an arrow going towards the grasshopper because the grass is consumed by the grasshopper. I like to remember the arrow direction by thinking about drawing the prey going into the predator's stomach. So from the grasshopper, I'm drawing an arrow into the shrew's stomach because that is where the energy went. That is where that organism went. So the shrew has an arrow being drawn into the owl because it's going into his stomach or into his body all of the energy or most of the energy, some of it. So there are two different ways to show these relationships, food chains and food webs. So the first one, food chains, are quite simple. They are just series of steps with one organism consuming another. So one animal or organism is eating another one. And it shows one type of organism for each step. So even though the grasshopper may be able to eat something other than grass, we're only showing grass. And even though grasshoppers um, and other insects are eaten by frogs. We only showed grasshoppers. I didn't show flies or dragonflies or whatever else frogs might eat. It's only one organism per step. And it's very simple. You can just think of it literally as a chain or a, you know, a necklace, a simple bracelet. It's a series of steps showing who is being eaten by who, but it's only one organism. Whereas a food web, is a series of food chains interacting. So it's multiple food chains all connected with each other, making a web. And this one shows a variety of foods consumed. It's not just focusing on a series of one organism and the next. It's a whole bunch of different ones interacting together, all connected. So as you know, there are limited resources in this world, and organisms have to interact with each other and these resources. So all organisms within a community are competing for limited resources. And you know that resources can include things that are living biotic or non-living abiotic. So you know food, water, shelter, predators. These are the things that we were calling environmental factors for evolution. So limited resources occurs in every community everywhere. So what you end up seeing are patterns of interactions between organisms, kind of like relationships between different organisms and these resources. So there are many different types of relationships or interactions, and we are going to talk about a few of them. So the first one that you will write down is competition. Now I know you know what competition is, so I want someone to volunteer an answer for this, so maybe pause the video and get an answer on what is competition. 
So competition is when two organisms are using the same limited resource, which means that they're going to have to fight over it. So I represented competition with the negative comma negative sign. So in the parentheses, I'm putting that when two organisms are interacting through competition, it is neg it is not positive. It's negative for the first organism and it's negative for the second organism. It's harmful to be involved in competition. So it's a negative negative relationship and in my pictures you can see cheetahs and lions are competing for the same meat or it could just be one lion and another lion fighting over the same meat it can be birds fighting over a place to stand <laughs> or seeds to eat it could be um you know we compete in sports so it's usually over of course something necessary for life, like food, water, or shelter. So the next one is predation. And I also want someone to tell me the definition of predation since I know you know this one. So predation is when one organism, the predator, eats all or part of another organism. So obviously, it is positive for the one that's doing the eating. It's a positive thing for the predator, and it's a negative thing for the prey. So that's why I have a positive-negative sign, because positive for one, being eaten is usually a negative thing, so negative for the other. And my example is the lynx, which is like this cat-like animal, is feeding on the snowshoe hair. Or these lions are eating this animal, or a snake eats a mouse, or a wolf eats a chicken, that's predation. One animal benefits and the other animal is harmed, or organism. So the next one I don't think you will know yet is called symbiosis. Symbiosis is a long-term relationship between two species. So a symbiotic relationship means that you have a relationship between two different species and either it will be a mutualism relationship, commensalism, or parasitism. So within the category of symbiosis, like living together, there are three different types, mutualism, commensalism, or parasitism. So the first one that we'll talk about is mutualism. And I think that you can also maybe raise your hand and come up with some examples of what mutualism is or two organisms in a mutualistic relationship. So you should have said something where it's a positive-positive relationship. So both organisms benefit from interacting with each other. So it's positive for both animals or organisms involved. Uh, in the top picture, a hummingbird is benefiting from getting nectar from the flower. The flower is benefiting because now the hummingbird will spread its pollen elsewhere. Same with the bee and the flower. So it's positive for both parties involved. The bottom one is a moray eel benefiting from the shrimp because the shrimp is cleaning its teeth out, kind of like being a dentist, and the shrimp is benefiting because he's getting food. Here is another example, um, another pollinator and a flower, but what is awesome is that you have co-evolution, co meaning together, like co-worker, cooperate, co is together, and you know evolution is change over time. So the, the flower and the bird have changed over time to fit each other. So you can see that the shape of the bird's bill matches the shape of the flower. They have co-evolved and they both benefit from each other. So the second symbiotic relationship is commensalism. Commensalism where we have a positive and then a zero. And I want someone to try to guess what that means. 
So, commensalism is when you have one organism benefiting from the relationship and the other one has no impact. So, two different species are interacting and one benefits and the other one is not harmed, it doesn't benefit, it's just neutral. And we have barnacles on a whale here. So, the barnacles are benefiting because they also eat plankton, and so when the whale is swimming through plankton, the barnacles can stick out their little antennae and like gobble up plankton as they go. They get a they get to travel around with the whale. The whale doesn't get really harmed by the barnacles, um, and at the same time, it doesn't benefit from them being stuck onto them. And if you're wondering how do barnacles stay onto the whale, I looked it up, and they have little prongs, little hooks that they literally bury. They like dig themselves into the whale's um, like nose area or like face or fins, and they hold on that way. So, fun fact. Okay, next one is parasitism, and parasitism. Well, I'll let you raise your hand and try to predict what that is. So parasitism is our last symbiotic relationship, and it's when one organism benefits, but then the other one is harmed by the relationship. So it's a relationship where two organisms, two individuals of different species, one benefits from it, one is hurt by it. And there are some gross examples of parasitism that I'm not going to tell you about now, but um, a simple one is the mosquito. Obviously, we don't like mosquito bites. They itch and they bother us, um, but the mosquito sure loves to suck our blood. So positive for the mosquito, negative for humans or whatever animals getting eaten by the mosquitoes. Um, so that's our last symbiotic relationship for today. And if you remind me, I have a really interesting one where a parasite goes into the brain of a fish and causes it to flop around and makes... Uh, birds eat them. Anyway, remind me later. Okay, so as a recap, we have competition, which was negative negative. Both individuals in the relationship were harmed by having to compete. Who wants to share food when you can eat it all yourself? Predation was positive for the predator, negative for the prey who gets eaten. Symbiosis includes the three beneath it, and that's just a long-term relationship or a relationship between two different organisms. So mutualism, positive, positive. It's a mutual relationship that benefits both of them. Commensalism is positive, neutral. So good for the barnacles, not doing anything for the whale. Parasitism is positive for the parasite, negative for the host. So mosquito is, would be the parasite, we would be the host. Um, other examples would be like tapeworm. Ew. So my question for you is what type of relationship is represented in this picture? So this is a symbiotic relationship, two different organisms having a long-term relationship with each other or interaction with each other, and it is a mutualistic relationship. This is showing mutualism because the shark is benefiting from these little fish are eating parasites off of the shark, eating the little, like, things attached to its skin, and then the little fish with the zebra stripes are benefiting because when the shark tears up its prey, the, sh the little fish get to eat up the scraps. So they're both benefiting. Now, if the zebra stripe sh fish were actually just being like free riders and just hanging out with the shark and not doing anything to help it, like not eating its parasites, then it would just be commensalism. So another example is the remora. So the remora fish is the one in the bottom right-hand corner. It is so cool. It has a suction cup on its head, on the top of its head. And what it does is it suction cups itself onto sharks, onto turtles, onto rays, and it also eats the parasites off of the sharks 
And so in the bottom left picture, it's actually upside down because its suction cup is on the back of its head. And it helps the sharks by eating the parasites. And the remora fish benefits as well because it eats the scraps off of what the shark is eating and basically what it does is the remora rides on the shark and then when the shark starts to eat something it pops itself off it undoes its suction cup and starts eating as well so I would say that this is a mutualistic relationship some people think that it doesn't really eat the parasites off of the shark and in that case it's more like the barnacles on a whale and that would be more like commensalism so I hope you enjoyed energy, flow, and relationships, and I will see you tomorrow.